I feel a bit at a disadvantage this evening. Normally the person who steps up to take the microphone to introduce the guest speakers themselves need no, needs no introduction. But since I'm brand new to Amsterdam, I know that I do need an introduction to you. Uh, my name is Arnold Campbell and I'm the American Consul General here in the Netherlands. I arrived just a little over a month ago and am enjoying uh, my tour here in the Netherlands thus far. Uh, I was invited to, by the director, Anna Wertheim, to introduce uh, our guest tonight and she conveys her regrets that she was unable to open the evening as she usually does, but she sends her regards from the United States. She also sent along a script uh, that I'm to read and stay to very precisely so to make sure I don't miss anything. So if I don't appear to be absolutely free in my delivery, please forgive me. On behalf of the John Adams Institute, I'd like to welcome you here tonight. I feel honored to welcome our guest speaker, the celebrated American author John Gray, and Yvonne Cronenberg, who will be monitoring, moderating this evening's lecture. I would also like, like to extend a special welcome to my colleague, uh, Phil Cosnett and his wife, who are here visiting from the embassy in The Hague. The American embassy is very proud of its uh, ability to be one of the co-sponsors of the John Adams Institute, and uh, we are especially pleased to be involved with uh, such a well-known and respected uh, author as uh, Dr. Gray. For those of you who are not familiar with the Institute, the John Adams Institute organizes about 10 lectures per year with American writers, artists, and scientists. The Institute appreciates your response to our lectures and thanks you for your financial contributions. I would also like to take this moment to thank the volunteers, the Dutch publisher Hud Spectrum and book importer Van Dittmar for their help in making this evening possible. If you would like to learn more about the Institute's lecture program, take a look at their brochure or join the mailing list by signing up at the information desk in the arrival hall. Dr. Gray, we greatly appreciate your presence here tonight. In the ever-growing body of your work, you have given people handy tools for handling what are often considered complicated relationships, and may I add, with overwhelming success. The lecture will begin with some opening remarks by the Dutch author and psychologist Yvonne Cronenberg. Ms. Cronenberg has published extensively about the relationships between men and women. After her introduction, Dr. Gray will speak for about 40 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. Uh, Ms. Cronenberg will, will provide some of the questions, but we also would like to encourage you in the audience to address your questions to our two experts. There are microphones in the aisles here on the floor to, so that everyone can hear your questions. People up in the balcony, if you have questions, be sure you, you're behind the lights, wave, wave wildly when you have a question up there, and uh, speak clearly. Uh, after we finish with the question and answer session, uh, at about 9.30, uh, Mr. Gray will be seated, remain seated here at the podium and we'll be happy to sign copies of his books which are available at the back of the hall. I hope that you have a very pleasant evening. I will again speak to you at the very end, but now I'd like to introduce Ms. Cronenberg. Hello. When I was eight years old, we had a magician come to our school to entertain us. I remember him well. He wore a black high hat and he had a dark moustache. He looked exactly like the magicians you would find in children's books. So I was sure this was not an imposter, but a real one, a genuine mag magician. And did he work miracles? He showed us an egg, put it under a handkerchief, sprinkled salt on it and had us call out some magic word and miraculously changed the egg into a pigeon. I do not remember what gave me the idea that I could do this myself at home, but I tried and I failed. Of course I failed. Magic isn't that easy. Years later, I must have been 18, I fell in love. The guy I loved was a music musician in a rock and roll band. He wore long hair, he had a dark moustache, and he didn't talk much. He had a difficult character, but I was sure I would change all that. <laughs> Love is a powerful agent. Love would overcome all our difficulties. 
Some difficulties, however, would not disappear. In spite of my encouragement and repeated invitation to share his thoughts with me, the man would remain reticent. His answers consisted mainly of mmph or mmm, <laughs> meaning yes, dear, if you say so, and I'm not sure I hold the same view, my love, respectively. His drinking habits I also did not seem to be able to alter. The man was a sponge and not a peace-loving one as some of your sponges. He was violent at times, many times. By the time I left this man, I knew love was not easy. The fastest way to end up in the arms of someone new is to say, I will never love again. The next man I embraced was very different from the first. He talked a lot about his feelings, and not only that, he could show his emotions. He cried in the cinema. <laughs> But somehow our love life didn't sparkle. Whatever I tried to turn him on, nothing worked. <laughs> Neither did his endeavors. We both did our best. I tried every trick in the book, and he would rub away diligently at my clitoris until I wondered whether he was trying to remove it. <laughs> after, after a few years, we gave up. Sex isn't that easy. You should live with a man. It kills your sex life, a knowledgeable friend stated. Love is such a lazy feeling that its fat bum crushes your passion. If you want good sex, save it for special occasions. She thinks the only way to preserve happiness and romantic love is to create a certain distance. Now, she may be right, but this only works if you're both single, independent, job-holding people. Once you have children or a complicated household, you need each other's presence to keep things going. But there is a great advantage in living apart. You have no house cleaning fight. I once lived with a man who would drop his dirty clothes where he had taken them off and who only rinsed the cup if he had used up all the clean ones. Shouting at him did not do any good, begging didn't either. He offered to help with the dishes and promised to vacuum if I reminded him. But when I did, he would say, yes, in a minute, and the minute never came. <laughs> By the time we split up, I felt like an old dish rag. Living with a man is not easy. Since the drinker, the crying man, and the pig, I've been happy <laughs> with many men, many times. You can't prevent sweet love from rearing its ugly head. Every time the romance ended, I was, of course, deeply devastated, but somehow I recovered and found out that all the pain and the tears hadn't been altogether fruitless. Looking back, I understand a lot of what went wrong and why. When I was in school, I also understood the algebra assignments after the test. Tonight, we are going to listen to a man who has spent a lot of thought on the way men and women blunder through their love lives. He has written many a book about it and has traveled around the world to lecture upon his subjects. Love, sex, communication between men and women, loss of love, the enhancement of mutual joy, the amelioration of life in general. He doesn't wear a magician's hat. He shaved off his mustache. I have no idea what he will do to an egg. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. From the Earth of America, we welcome John Gray to tell us how to work miracles. Thank you. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Let's give her a hand. Oh, fantastic. Uh, really, very nice, very beautiful. Uh, now, my intention tonight is to share with you the ideas, many of the ideas in my newest book called Practical Miracles for Mars and Venus. And many of you may know me for, I think most of you do know me, as the men are from Mars, women are from Venus. And I thought, well, I'm only going to talk about my new book. But after the introduction, I think I should talk 10 minutes about men are from Mars, women are from Venus, since many of you know me for that. But then I'd like to branch into the subject of my newest book, which is self-healing. 
many of you may not know, I was a Hindu celibate monk for nine years in my 20s. Uh, and it really altered my life. When I started having relationships with women, they truly were from another planet. People wonder, where do you get this perspective? I knew myself inside out as a man, and I felt good about myself as a man, and I could be happy as a man. I was completely autonomous. I didn't need a woman in my life. I didn't even need food. I used to go for a month at a time just on water. I used to meditate 15, 20 hours a day sometimes. Lovely experience. It was a wonderful time in my life. But I found that as I continued being more and more spiritual uh, in a rather rebellious way, that my ability to participate in the world went down. Like to be happy, I wanted to pull away. I lived in Switzerland in the mountains and visit America occasionally, but it was too stressful. And I go back into a heavenly kind of state of consciousness by leaving the world. At 28, I realized that I had well, I had beautiful experiences, but I realized that I had achieved a certain level of fulfillment in my spiritual quest, and now it was time to be a regular person. You know, I felt a bit like a hypocrite giving advice to people when I didn't have a wife, I didn't have children, I didn't have a mortgage payment to pay, and I didn't have a job. It's very easy to be happy if you learn how to meditate and you just sit in meditation all day. No pressures, no stress, particularly if you're good at it, and I was very good at it. And then when I came back to America, I was broke. I had no job and I was homeless. I had a resume. We'll meditate and pray for your company. <laughs> it doesn't really work very well. And I was again rebellious. I didn't know that I wanted to become a part of the capitalist system of America until I was starving. And I didn't have a place to live and I was on the beaches and I was very unhappy. Uh, I could go into an altered state of meditation and be happy, but then when I opened my eyes, it was cold and it wasn't very comfortable. So I surrendered and started praying to God and said, please, send me money. <laughs> and from the perspective that I lived in at that time, it would be non-spiritual to ask for money. You're supposed to ask for God, enlightenment, or help people, help the world, but they say, hey, give me some money, was not spiritual. But I remember, the, after I did that prayer, uh, I think it was the next day, I bumped into a friend of mine, and he gave me $50, a hundred of your currency. And that was 30, uh, 25 years ago, or something like that, and uh, 20, 22 years ago, I suppose, uh, to be accurate. And $50 then was a lot of money. And he could just see I was hungry, but I wouldn't tell anybody. And he just gave it to me. And I was so grateful for money. And from that day on, I said, money is spiritual. Money is good. I want money. Thank you, God, for money. Okay, that's what I want. And coming from an open, uh, loving perspective and feeling good about money allowed money to come into my life because I enjoy money. And some people don't care about that much about money, but I enjoy it a lot. So I seem to have a lot. It comes to me. The second thing was no sex for nine years. When I, I remember meeting this woman, she says, what do you do? I said, nothing, I just sit and meditate. <laughs> I said, what does she do? And she said, she's a massage therapist. And what would you like, would you like a massage? I went, a massage? I said, sure. And this is California back in the late 70s. And so I started to lay down on the table. She said, no, you have to take off your clothes first. And I didn't know they did that. You know, take off my clothes? Yeah, everything. Okay, sounds good. But it was like so strange for me. I hadn't been touched by a woman for nine years and suddenly now I'm laying on the table. And during that time she asked me, why are you celibate? And for the first time, I had no answer. I said, I don't know. Because <laughs> every, every cell in my body said there's no reason to be celibate. And, and I think all the blood was down south. God played a trick on men. He gave us, or she, whoever, gave us two brains, one up here, one down there, but only enough blood to run one at a time. <laughs> so. so I have to say, really, when she asked, why are you celibate, I really didn't have no reason. It was just no reason. And very quickly, we started making love. And I think, 
I think to her, the idea of having sex with a guy who hadn't had sex in nine years was very exciting to her as well. But it lasted three days. We took breaks, but it didn't... Uh, <laughs> You know, people always ask me, what was sex life a after nine years? Because before I became a celibate monk, I, was, I very much liked sex. I'm a very sexual person. I enjoy it a lot. But for spiritual reasons, there's a, for many spiritual people in different traditions, uh, I was affiliated with, with the uh, Transcendental Meditation Movement at the time. If you remember back in the 60s, the Beatles uh, went to India to meet the Maharishi. Well, I thought this was great. You know, Beatles, drugs, Maharishi, get high. <laughs> So he came to America, and I thought, oh, I'll go see the Maharishi, and maybe I'll meet the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the Beatles weren't there, but I, I was very inspired by the possibilities of consciousness expansion. Uh, what was promised is you know, great ecstasy and great joy and great creative abilities and the, the ability to have powers. I thought, what are these powers? This was really something. And I'm a young teenage guy, and I said, I'll do this. So I started doing the TM thing, and I became his personal assistant. I, he had a big movement in the world. Uh, he lived in Switzerland, and I lived there for quite a while, for nine years, basically, as his assistant or in re as a recluse, just in a hotel room somewhere, meditating every day, occasionally coming out to eat or visit with people. So that was all kind of my background, and uh, I never got all the powers. It was sort of disappointing. Uh, but I did have beautiful spiritual experiences, and it was a wonderful time in my life. And I, I suppose I had some, quote, spiritual powers. At, at the very end, I was fasting for a week on water. I did that quite a bit. And I started hearing angels singing, and it was beautiful just to hear this music. Uh, just suddenly there was this music, and it was something like you'd hear with Handel's Messiah or something like Mozart would do, something really beautiful. And the truth is, that's how most of these great composers composed their music. They didn't like figure it out, they just heard it. And they knew how to write it down and reproduce it. And that's how it happens. And, and geniuses, they don't figure things out, they just hear it. They just see it. Uh, when I give this talk, I don't have any plan. I had no idea I'm going to tell you about my sex life in my 20s. I just stand up and say what comes out. And people say, how long does it take you to write a book? It takes about a month. I write a book a year, I take a month off, I sit down and just write a book. And the rest of the year I talk about it and talk to more people and get new ideas and teach ideas and counsel people and a whole other book just forms in my head and I write another one. And I could write two. I mean, I've got like five in my computer right now that probably will never be printed because my publishers say, you, you have to slow down because people have to buy the book, talk about it, so then we're ready for another one. <laughs> uh, I'm very prolific. Uh, it's endless. I mean, it's fun to write and yet, when I was young, I never made good grades in writing. My worst subject. I hated writing. I couldn't stand writing. And the other subject I didn't like was talking public speaking. <laughs> when I got involved with the Transcendental Medi Meditation Movement, I became a TM teacher. I was the youngest TM teacher at the time. I was 18, 19 years old. And I remember giving my first talk. It was the theme of the talk was four people on a panel, and you each had one little subject. And my subject was develop your full mental potential. Now, I had memorized my talk, you know, young guy. I knew everything I was going to say, practice and practice, but I was so nervous. I was so anxious. I couldn't talk in front of groups, but I was going to do it because I wanted to help the world and do something. So I remember standing in front of the group, my knees shook involuntarily. First of all, there was huge anxiety before getting there. Then I stood in front, my knees started shaking. Then the room began to spin and I fainted. And here I am giving a talk on develop your full mental potential. <laughs> And everybody was so sad in the audience, they thought I had died, you know, because literally, if you see someone faint, they look like they died. Everyone was like all upset. I put my eyes, all these people were all upset. I said, it's okay, it's okay. But it took me years to overcome my fear of public speaking. As you can see, I have none. I'm completely relaxed. I go all the shows, all the everything, do interviews, do everything. Very peaceful. No stress at all, because I overcame that obstacle. Life always gives us challenges. We all have gifts. But when you get close to a, a something which is a real special gift, there's always the biggest obstacles. See, if you don't follow your heart, if you don't do what you feel is important to you, then you get to play comfortable. You get to play safe. If you do something that you really want to do and it's really good for you, all this energy comes in. And if you don't believe you can do it, then the energy gets blocked. So you feel anxiety, huge anxiety. So to avoid the anxiety, what do we do? Oh, I don't want to bother. And I went through that. I remember I had so much anxiety.
But I really wanted to be a teacher and teach the world good things. And it wasn't about three years I was seriously thinking I shouldn't talk because this was just too painful to keep doing this job. It caused so much anxiety, so much stress. And I read an interview with John Lennon in the Rolling Stones and it changed my life. And he was explaining why the Beatles stopped touring. And that's because when they went on tour, they would be so anxious. They had so much anxiety. Before performance, John Lennon would throw up. He was so sick. He would literally get sick doing those performances, and particularly before them. And I thought, I looked at that and I thought, well, if John Lennon can be anxious, I can be anxious. And I said, it wasn't a bad omen. Because often we think, well, if I'm so nervous doing this, it must mean that I'm not supposed to do it or I can't do it. When all, many times it's the opposite is true. So I remember with, uh, with the John Lennon thing, there was one other point, but I will just went over it. It just disappeared, so I'll just move on. I think I was thinking, there's only 40 minutes for me to talk here, John. You're telling your life story. <laughs> I think when you start telling your story, I start just telling my story. Okay, I'll just tell my life story here. It's all part of my book, Practical Miracles. And in Practical Miracles, there's this idea that we have these blocks that hold us back from being ourselves. Anxiety is one of those blocks. We just get nervous. We say, if I'm going to do that, it's, it's too uncomfortable. I don't want to do it. So then what do we do? Some of us say, I'm going to do it anyway. So we do it anyway, and then we have all this energy flowing in our life, but we're not yet comfortable with it. And so what do we do is we then try to burn up that energy. One of the very common things, a joke in America, is when people will come home from work, they watch some TV for a while, and they, they go numb. They just turn on the TV set and go numb. And sometimes that does, all that energy just... You think of yourself like a racehorse. And you know, if you want to do something in the world or you want love, you want to be loving to your children or you want to be creative in your life and you feel you can be creative and you want to be creative, well, that's a lot of energy. When you have desire, you have a lot of energy coming in. So when that energy comes in, if you don't use the energy, then it makes you real uncomfortable. If you're not using the energy that you have in your body that you get from life, you become very uncomfortable. So in America, what they do is you come home, it's late at night, you still have this sort of restless feeling, the TV didn't fully numb you out. So then they go hunting. They don't know what they're looking for, they hunt. What is it that I want? I don't know, what do I want? I just, something's missing. You think they remember because they go through this ritual almost every night, but they go, what do I want? And you go up to the refrigerator, maybe this. And they look in and nothing looks good. Then they go, oh, well, maybe the freezer. And they open the freezer and they go, ah, ice cream. They do. They're like addicted to ice cream. Then they oh, eat a whole pint of ice cream. Lay it Okay. Ah, oh, now I feel so much better. Because what's happening with all addictive behaviors is we have all this energy and we have to burn it up. We have to we, we make it numb. We suppress it or we use it up. Like I have a friend. He's actually a, a famous public speaker as well in America. And every day he has to run, uh, I think it's seven or nine miles. He jogs. He never one day, he said, in the last 30 years, he's never missed that jog. If he's on a big plane, he jogs in the back of the plane. He's got to get his nine hours. I'm not at nine hours. That's how long it would take me to run nine miles. Uh, he's got to get, I did a tour of Australia with him. Now, you probably know of him, Wayne Dyer. He's very popular here, also with my publisher. He's a great guy. And part of where he gets his happiness is he does that run. I mean, he's going to use that energy up. And we're in, we're in Australia doing this tour together, and it was like terrible weather. You know, there was blizzards, and it was cold, and he puts on his little shorts, and he goes out and runs for nine miles. I mean, I can't believe this guy, but he comes back exhausted, but feels great. Why? Because he needs to use up all that energy. And if you're not going to use it up through physical exercise, or through hard work, or through giving your love to people, and caring for people, and doing things, if you're not using your energy up, then you feel very uncomfortable. So what do we do with that uncomfortable energy? What we do is we numb it. We numb it by saying, well, I don't really want that anyway. I'm not going to do that anyway. That's one way to numb it. Another way we numb it is we just use it up with addictions. Smoking, that's why smoking literally burns the energy up. You smoke the energy, it goes right in, causes certain hormones to react. You feel peaceful. It's, always, it's the peace pipe in the American Indians they smoke tobacco before they have an argument. Okay, it's a peace pipe. Let's all relax. Let's cool down. Let's smoke a cigarette here. They just weren't addicted to it. What happened in America with the Marlboro cigarettes 
is they put things in it to make it more addictive so you can't live without it. Instead of an occasional smoke to relax, they put nicotine in it to make you want it. It's a chemical substance they put in it that makes you have to have it. They also do something else is they take the paper and they soak the paper in white sugar. And, that, and then when you burn it, that's why it has such a bad effect on you. One of the reasons is that the tar comes from the, white, from the white paper soaked in white sugar and that also makes it more addictive. So they did this to make people take, buy more, buy more. Well, all the food manufacturers caught on to this in America. I don't know about here. I assume a bit of the same. If you look on the label of any food in the grocery store, everything has sugar in it. Everything. Get some beans, sugar. Get some ketchup, sugar. Everything that adds sugar to it because sugar is addictive. Let's get these people to depend on these things so that they feel good. Because one of the easiest ways to burn off that excess energy, if I had a podium, I'd put a big words here. It's a very important part of my message. Excess energy. Too much energy. That's our problem in this world. Now, we didn't have this problem before this century. If you go back several centuries back, go to... Well, I'll talk about cultures where you can still see how people lived a long time ago. Go to India. Go to Peru. Go to places where there's a strong caste system. You're born in a certain level of society and you're taught from a child you'll never have anything more. So accept your lot in life. Accept the way you are. Don't desire more. And religions are built upon giving up your own personal desire. Western religions are built upon Stealing sin or selfishness if you have desire. They figured this out a long time ago. That if you let people have desire and encourage them to want more, they have all this energy. And when they have all that energy, if they can't fulfill those wishes, they get mad. One of the things we learned in America is there was such a suppression of the black people in America until the 60s. There still is somewhat, but it was huge. Black people had to be in the back of buses. They couldn't go into a restaurant. They couldn't be with the white people. It was horrible the way they treated people. And this just in the 60s. Then the Johnson administration came in and they started saying equality for the black people. Equality in America. Everybody should have equal rights. Let's treat everybody differently. And they started making all these laws. After those laws were made, that's when the black people started rioting. Huge riots. They never had the black people become more angry than when they were given permission, when they gave themselves permission to say, yes, I deserve more, I have rights. As soon as a person feels they have rights, I'm entitled to something, I want something, then all this energy flows. But if they don't know how to use that energy, it gets blocked. It becomes excess energy, and the symptom of excess energy in your body on a surface level is restlessness, discomfort, a bit of nervousness, a little deeper, if you start feeling into it, you're angry, or you're sad, or you're disappointed, or you're afraid, or you're nervous, or you have embarrassment, or you have shame. All these emotions, what we call negative emotions, are all the symptoms of all this energy getting blocked. So you know, when you're upset, it's just blocked energy. And what most people do when they're upset is they go and they use up that energy in some way. And the, the point of practical miracles is that one of the reasons we don't get what we want in life is we're all the time numbing ourselves to that creative energy. When I write a book, for example, and it didn't used to be this way. I used to sleep late, always tired, a low energy, chronic fatigue syndrome, all that stuff. Now, if I write a book, I get up at 2 a.m. in the morning, write until 8 o'clock in the morning where I take my children to school, go back, write till 3 o'clock, pick my kids up, do homework with them, Go to bed around eight or nine, get a few hours sleep, get up and push through again. Tremendous amount of energy has come to me once I started learning how to manage energy. I don't drink coffee anymore, don't need it. And people say, oh, how do you get up without coffee? I mean, I don't know how much you drink. I know Americans, they're all drinking coffee. They're coughing here, coffee there, coffee there. It's not coffee, it's black tea, drink black tea, stimulating, stimulating. Completely addicted to things to give us energy. As if you... Yeah, I'm not against those things, not bad, but why do you need it when, you're just, when our problem in life is too much energy? We have so much energy, but we're not accessing it because it's blocked. So in the old days, what they did is they told you and had religions to say, don't desire, and then people become more peaceful, numb, peaceful. What we have today is television and democracies. Those two things together, commercials. You see those commercials? I'm sure it's not this way here, but in America, 
the commercials come on. Every commercial, there's always a car commercial. I, I one day I just started analyzing how many car commercials are there on TV? They just don't stop. It's like everybody where I live has a new car. They're fed this message goes in. Bigger, better car, better car, better car, get a car, get this, get that. And people then seeing the movies where people always have nice things and whatever, and then they start looking at what they have and it doesn't look as good. So then they start saying, I want more, I want more, and they can't get more, so what do they feel? Frustrated, disappointed, angry. So all this pain is being felt, blocked energy. So you have people, when you don't deal with the pain emotionally, when you don't know how to let go of that and take that energy and put it into something positive, then what happens to the pain is it goes numb and it goes into your body. So from emotional pain, we go to physical pain. And physical pain, we go to degenerative disease. We, don't, we didn't live over 100 years ago, so we don't know what the medical situation was. I've talked to doctors who are 90 years old, and they said before antibiotics, you know, of course they use the old thing of bloodletting and crazy stuff, but the reality is people didn't get all these sicknesses, osteoporosis, heart disease, cancer, MS, multiple sclerosis, and the list goes on and on. They didn't get those kind of sicknesses. They were rare. They happened, but they were rare. Now they say in America, I just don't know the statistics here, it's, you're amazed these statistics go up. Just 30 years ago, uh, 50 years ago, it was uh, something like 2%, 3% were expected to get cancer. Then after 20 years, it went up to 20%. Then after another 10 years, it went up to 30%. And if the curve keeps going, they figure soon it's going to be 50% of America's one in every two gets cancer. You go, what is happening here? It's like this, the amount of sickness which is going on in the world. And it starts just with aches and pains in your body. Many of us, as we get older, over 40, there tends to be a curve that happens. Your body just starts hurting aches and pains. And people think, well, I'm just getting old. As if that's normal. The body is not designed to feel pain unless something's hurting you. Unless something's actually jabbing you or you're doing something bad for yourself. In that moment, your body will feel pain. If, you're, if your pain lasts, it means something's wrong with your body. It's not healing itself. Our bodies are designed to heal themselves. And we have to learn how to activate that ability. As a general rule, most of us, not everybody, most of us up to about 40, our body does heal itself. It keeps, you know, you get a little accident, your body heals itself. You get, a, you get some viruses and you're kind of weak, you'll catch a cold, you'll get a flu, but you'll get over it. Then you get older, it turns into pneumonia or it causes some condition in your liver, something in your adrenaline, something all around your body. These sicknesses start to develop. There's so much sickness now that never happened before and what's happening is we just keep using drugs to try to solve the problem. And what drugs do is they don't solve the problem at all. They numb the body. Now they're great if you don't have another solution. For me, I'm 40, 48 years old, 48 years old. For all the way up to about 45, my whole life, ever since I was a little boy, I had allergies. How many of you have allergies? Just out of curious, you know, just some places they do. Well, where I live is like the allergy capital of the world, Marin County, California, it's just, allergies everywhere. And I thought the other place I lived, which was Houston, Texas, which is a very moist area, is the allergy capital of the world. I left Texas because I was so allergic. I went to Switzerland. I had no allergies. Just the air was so clear and clean. But then I went to California again with enormous amount of pollen and, and, and whatever would happen in spring. All my allergies came back. I needed medication. I'm so grateful because the medication would allow me to survive. Otherwise, I'd be ripping my eyes out with pain. It was just horrible to have allergies. I'm just giving one personal example here. Then I started learning this energy, these energy techniques, which I'm going to teach you tonight, and a little bit about making a few small adjustments in your diet. And what happens is, I know for me what happened, and for my clients, allergies went away. All I have to do, though, is one of the things you have to not all the time give up, but one of the things is you have to give up most of the time rat poison. You have to give up rat poison. Now, I use that as a symbol. There's a food that we all eat, which is almost as bad as rat poison. Literally poisons the body. Now, we've learned about this since 1960. There was a book that came out called Sugar Blues. Oh, you've heard of it. Okay, so we all read Sugar Blues. It was the hippie thing to do, okay? But none of us could give up sugar. 
I mean, I spent 20 years unable to give up sugar. Even when I was a little monk eating a bowl of food a day, sometimes what I would eat is a bowl of ground up almonds and powdered sugar. <laughs> I mean, I was a sugar addict. I mean, sugar is great. The body needs sugar, but it doesn't need it in a refined form. It needs it through fruit. Eat through fruit, the body gets lots of, lots of the sugar it needs. What happens with refined sugar? I'm going to say this very short because some people aren't aware of what goes on with refined sugar. And this is what Sugar Blues explained. Doctors explained it back 30 years ago. Now, fortunately, there's this wonderful book on the bestseller list in America now for over two years. Sugar, uh, it's called Sugar Busters because they found that if you just stop eating refined sugar, you start losing weight. And of course, the number one sickness in America is obesity and, and overweightness. People can't lose weight. If you stop eating refined sugar, your body starts healing itself and you can start burning off. You don't have to eat less. You don't have to eat less fat. You don't have to watch your diet. You just give up sugar, <laughs> refined sugar. Eat lots of natural sugars, which is fruit. The, the problem with that book, Sugar Busters, is it's written by a bunch of doctors. I love doctors when you're sick, <laughs> but they also make a lot of mistakes too. And one of the things that is this whole group of doctors, they recommend people instead of refined sugar, drink diet drinks with aspartame in it. Nutrasweet, those things, that's aspartame. Probably in about five years, they'll be sued for billions and billions of dollars because there's already evidence that they know that aspartame kills people, causes lupus, causes almost every sickness you can imagine. The literature's there. They keep putting it in front of the American Congress and it keeps putting off to the side in committees and committees and committees. But all that, you can read it on the internet. Just do aspartame on the internet. And you'll see stories you won't believe. One interesting story was a group of people with cancer, with, with uh, lupus. And the only thing they did, I think 20 or 30 people, is they did everything the same, no medications, nothing. All they did is had them stop drinking diet sodas, with, which have aspartame in them. And every person in the study improved or completely healed of lupus just by giving up that aspartame. It's so dangerous, and yet it's a multi-billion dollar business. And people think, oh, I'm going to lose some weight. I won't eat the refined sugar. The refined sugar already is bad enough for you. Another thing about what refined sugar does is as soon as you put refined sugar in your body, it turns your body fluids and makes them acidic. It will also make your blood acidic. But if your blood becomes acidic, you'll die. The blood always has to be at a constant balance between acid and alkaline state. I think it's like 7.8. So as soon as you start putting acids in your body, the blood has to be brought back up to an, acidic, an alkaline state. And to do that, it needs minerals. So it leaches minerals out of your bones. So now it's very well known that people get osteoporosis. All this, never in history have people had osteoporosis. This is a very rare thing. Now, women are everywhere getting osteoporosis. Bones are getting weaker and weaker and weaker as people get older and older. Refined sugar literally leeches. It rips, it draws out of the bones minerals. The minerals that you need for your body to build and be strong, you get weaker and weaker. So you get quick energy when you burn sugar if you've got excess energy in you, excess energy, energy is not being used. So if you put some refined sugar in your stomach, it takes that energy and it burns it. See, the excess energy is like a bunch of logs. The sugar is like lighting it. So it burns up the energy. So immediately you get all this energy, you feel really good, and you crash down. And then you feel like, now I need sugar again. And so we become addicted to sugar. So I knew about that. I heard all that stuff. I went for periods of time without sugar. And then I went back on it. Thinking, well, if I was just more enlightened... I could handle sugar. But the truth is, the more enlightened you become, the more sensitive your body is, and it tells you if something's a poison. And the way it tells you something's a poison is it makes you sick right away. If I even touch a cookie, <laughs> I pick up a cookie and eat it with refined sugar in it, I immediately start to itch my nose and start having my allergies. Allergies gone. I'll start getting tired. You know, I run on the super fuel. The super fuel works. What is the super fuel? Water. Completely gives you energy. Every person who's sick, now doctors don't tell you this, but they know this. They just don't put it together. Nobody's put this together so simply. When anybody goes into the hospital, what's the first thing they do? They put you on an IV. They run salt water through your body because you're dehydrated. When people are sick, they're dehydrated. There's nobody who's well. I'm saying there's nobody who's sick who's sufficiently hydrated. I see hundreds of people. They're sick. 
I take a pinprick of blood, you put it under a microscope, and I show them what their cells look like. If I had a board, I would draw it for you. You'd see that their cells are all clumped together in this space, and they're all clumped together, like 10, 15 cells all sticking together, four over here all clumped together, these little cells that they are. And there's a lot of debris and trash in between, little debris and trash. The sicker somebody is, the more dehydrated they are. Also, there's an alkaline level, their acid level. You can measure by the, measuring the pH how sick somebody is. Water will raise the alkaline level in your body. If you actually take water and minerals, like anything with calcium in water, it will immediately go to alkaline. In America, I put these little calcium things in my water. They don't sell them here, but it will immediately turn. You can measure it with a stick. You can measure the alkaline level going up. So you're putting alkaline in your body because some of our water is acid. Anyway, I don't want to go too much in all that. Just simple stuff. So you show people their blood and they see they're sick. All their blood is clumped together. And I pick my blood. Here's my blood. Look at my blood. And what you'll see is all the cells are hydrated. It just took drinking lots of water to get to this state in time. And they all float all by themselves. Like our wonderful speaker, she loves living alone. She has space around her. Like all of us Martians, we love space around us. We know that if you get too close, what happens? You feel irritable. You need to have room to be yourself. You need to feel there's a place for you. Fortunately, I'm now at a place in my life after teaching for 30 years where I get to fly first class when I travel. Boy, does it make a difference. I come over with a smile. You know, they take photo shoots of me. They did a photo shoot of me right out of the plane. And they said, well, can we do a photo shoot up? My, my assistant said, oh, no, you're exhausted and tired. I said, no, I always feel great after a plane ride. You ride first class, it's a whole different story. When people ride first class, not because of the food, because most of the people don't eat that food because they know that any air food food is going to give you more jet lag. Some do do it because they get free drinks, but if anybody can be in first class, they can afford drinks. So it's not like, oh, I get free drinks in first class, you know, <laughs> none of that. The reason they go first class is you have space around you. That's what makes all the difference. I will see, I'll predict that in 10 years, people will start suing <laughs> the airlines <laughs> for those cramped compartments that they put people in. It is so unhealthy. And what you also don't know is you get no fresh air on a plane ride. They recirculate the air. They don't even give you fresh air. They just recondition the air as it goes through and they keep recirculating. All you're doing is just breathing your neighbor. <laughs> when you're in first class, you're not. You get to have your own space around you. Well, I use that as a wonderful metaphor. It's the same thing with your blood, which gives you life. Your cells, which give you life. You can fly first class and hydrate yourself with lots of water, or you can fly coach and be all clumped in with everybody else. And it's your choice. It's such a reality. We're sick, we catch, I don't catch colds, catch flus, none of that stuff. Why? I used to, you know, we're not, not, not talking about a person with a strong constitution who never got sick or never did this. We're talking about a person with a weak constitution, had allergies, would catch cold, would catch flus, would be miserable, I hated it, I couldn't stand it. You drink a lot of water, it's just one of the techniques, not just water alone, but water will hydrate your body so that now your cells can be healthy. They can do their work. The next thing I show people after they've done their blood is I do this technique I'm going to do with you tonight. Simple technique of learning to energize your body. Now this is not esoteric. It has been taught in an esoteric way throughout history. I've studied in around the world 20 times, going around to all kinds of esoteric systems to find out how does this magic healing happen that you hear about. Back in 1992, I went blind in my left eye. I had an infection in the eye and it got worse and worse until I lost the vision in the eye. Went to 16 doctors, they could not heal it. They said, look, be lucky it's just one eye. Well, it wasn't enough for me. So I decided to make some changes in my life. And one of the things I did is started traveling around to energy healers or spiritual healers, people that are known for doing miracles. And I could afford it. I could travel there. I could, you know, when you have money, you can be a VIP anywhere. You know, you can just say, hey, you know who I am. I've done this and this and this. And you get to right at the front of the line and you get to see these people. And I spend time with them and I make them tell me their secrets. So I could understand how they do it. And they all do it the same thing, but they do it all differently. And I'm going to tell you what they all do. And I'm going to teach you to do it. And what's amazing is you can all do it. You can do it for others, but first you have to learn to do it for yourself. When you get down to the core of what it is that's done. And, I, and you're already doing it anyway. Notice a day when you're stressed. 
and it's now the weekend. What do you do on the weekend? You go, well, I don't know exactly what you do here, but I know what we do in America, so I'll say that. If we, you live in New York City, if you have money, there's an exodus. Everybody leaves the city to go to the country. They go to the beach where they're around the ocean, water. Okay? And one of the reasons, this is a very heavily populated area. It doesn't feel like New York City, though. First, it doesn't have high buildings, but also you have water running through all the time. Water is a natural force. Natural forces have an actual frequency. Now, studies at UCLA in California have measured frequencies of natural elements. The Earth has a frequency of 7.8 megahertz. If you are put in what's called a Faraday cage, which is a, uh, some Faraday, realize if you make a cage in certain dimensions, you can push away all electromagnetic fields. If you go in this Faraday cage, within a matter of 15 minutes. Just, nothing has changed except they've got just some metal around you, not running anything through it, but it basically, it blocks the electromagnetic fields. We are always being affected by electromagnetic fields. The Earth has a particular kind of electromagnetic field. It's a healing electromagnetic field. When they said this is an underground church, I went, ooh, it turns out not to be underground, but I was all excited to be underground teaching because to be underground actually has more healing energy. When I was a monk, you would go up into the mountains and find a cave and you go inside these caves. When I go to the Himalayas, it was a great find to go these places where yogis would meditate for years and years and years. And why would, where would they go? Inside the earth. Wonderful place to do meditation. It's a very different experience because you're surrounded by the earth frequency. You know the whole thing, om, the om sound? If you go into a cave, you just start hearing it. It's just the earth resonance there opens you up and it's just very relaxing and peaceful. Well, we don't have that in our lives when we're surrounded by all these other electromagnetic fields. Electricity. I'm not against electricity. I'm not against anything which is modern. Computers. I have computers. I have electricity. I've got every gadget. I've got a great car. I fly planes. Do all that stuff. I'm not against it. But what I've learned to do is balance that by making sure every day I have time to be in nature. Just like what you do on the weekend as you go out and expose yourself to water, to sunshine, to fresh air, to earth, to natural things. And you're already doing that and you know that when you do that, you feel better. What's actually the great thing about jogging is you're breathing more. Also, you're, you're wasting your energy doing it. I mean, when I tell my friends in China, there's these guys 100, 200 years old, you know, they don't do all these exercises. They're completely happy and their bodies are completely healthy. And I don't know about here, but I know in America they think you have to be exercising every day to be healthy. I said, I want to prove to you, I used to be 30 pounds overweight. I'm not going to do any exercise for two months. I'm going to eat a lot of food. I'm just not going to eat the refined sugar and drink a lot of water and I lost 30 pounds. Exercise, you don't have to exercise to lose weight. You don't have to exercise, you have to walk around and use your body. But if you're going to eat a lot of food, you need to exercise. See, but because your body has to burn it up some way. But if you're not eating tons of food, you don't have to use your body. And you see these people who are overweight and they're all feeling guilty. They're not exercising because they hate exercise. And you know why they hate exercise? Because for them to exercise, they got to carry around 50 extra pounds, 100 extra pounds. And you see the people who love exercise, they're trim like me. Oh, I love it, you know, because you're running around. You're not having to carry weights while you do it. But we're, we're so crazy in the way that we try to make ourselves healthy. Listen to your body. But it, the problem is, is we can't fully listen to our body because we have these addictions. There's certain poisons. And we put the rat poison in. <laughs> what that will do is prevent us from being able to hear our body. If you're drinking sodas or, or alcohol, I'm not against alcohol in any way, but if you drink alcohol regularly or coffee regularly, what happens is you disconnect from your body's natural thirst for water. You'll see unconsciously, I'll pick up a glass of water about every 20 minutes like a dog. <laughs> I feel thirsty. I feel, you know, I have all these other drinks. I used to love Cokes and all this stuff. I, why would I want to drink that now? This is not a makeup mind belief. I'm thirsty for water. Water is the most tasty, delicious drink once you discover natural thirst. But if you drink other things, like fruit juices, for example, everybody's saying, oh, fruit juice is so good. Well, we just had a little glass of orange juice. Somebody offered to me the other day. I said, why would I drink a glass of orange juice? It takes five oranges to make that glass of orange juice. Who's going to sit down and eat five oranges? What they've done with that glass of orange juice is the same thing they do with refined sugar that we people don't understand. Is they take out the minerals, they take out the pulp, 
They take out the nutrients, they take out the vitamins, and you're left with just the sugar. The universe makes that, or God, however you want to look at nature, has everything in that beet. Most of our sugar comes from beets. The minerals, the nutrients, the vitamins, this pulp necessary to digest and burn the sugar, to burn the sugar, are all in the beet. It's all right there. Eat the beet and you can deal with all that sugar. And it's not much beet sugar you get in a beet. You got like a whole bag of beets for one Coca-Cola. You just ate a whole bag of beets, at least the energy of that. But you have none of the nutrients, none of the minerals, none of the proteins, none of that stuff. So in order to burn the sugar, it has to take it out of your body. To be healthy, your body needs the minerals and nutrients and so forth. Then you drink a soda and suddenly you just depleted yourself of it. And then you have low energy, so you keep living off the energy and your body gets drained and drained till you get around 40 years old and your body starts to crash. It's like you get 40 free years of being completely irresponsible for your body. And by that time, if you don't start taking responsibility and listen to your body, what works for you, what doesn't work for you, and respect your body, just like you'd want to respect somebody you love, and hear that they don't like that, hear that that's not helping them. Like a child, you wouldn't want to give poison to your child, yet you'll turn around and poison yourself. If you continue doing that, then your fate is the fate of most people over 40. Their health starts to decline, going down like that. It doesn't happen to everybody. Somehow people stay healthy and you can keep your body's natural healing power. And once you've lost it, you can recover it. I have this book, Practical Miracles, it's all based on a change that I've seen in the last three years. Now, I've been teaching self-healing techniques for 30 years. And I got really excited about it eight years ago when I went and started studying with a lot of alternative type healers and regained my vision in my left eye. So it's back to exactly the way it was before, or at least the vision part, right back to the way it was. I still wear glasses for reading and all that, but it came back. I was like blown away. Then I used the same techniques for healing my allergies, same techniques for getting rid of weight, which were my weaknesses in my body. Then I started teaching other people this stuff and was a surprise. I remember my first miracle healing three years ago, a woman came to me on her deathbed. Doctors had given her up. She had 14 tumors in her body, inoperable, four stage four cancer, had 20 treatments of chemotherapy and radiation, was dying. They said, just, you know, die. And somebody told him that I do healing. She came. I said, I don't know if I can do this. You know, I help people with, you know, easier things. Well, it turned out that the serious diseases work faster. See, if you have a cold, you can't just get an energy healing and it goes away. A cold actually is a sign your body's trying to fight something off. Degenerative, life-threatening diseases, your body's not even fighting it off. It's just dying. So if you awaken the immune system, it starts to heal itself. So I show these people when I do healings on them, just 10 minutes teaching them what I'm going to teach you tonight. Their cells are clumped together. They stay clumped together. Healing doesn't do anything to hydration, unfortunately. You've got to drink water and you've got to stop temporarily. You've got to stop taking things to dehydrate you or at least drink even more water. You could, basically, you need about a half a gallon of water a day. That's what most nutritionalists say you need. About, that's about eight to ten glasses of water a day. If, oh, they're telling me my time. Is my time up? Yes. That's 40 minutes? Okay, I'll finish this part. All right, we'll get to there. If, uh, let me just get to this one thought, which is drinking water. If you have a glass of wine, that means you need an extra glass of water. Because wine, they've proven this, wine dehydrates your body. That means your cells are getting clumped together, you wake up kind of feeling uh, the next day. Coffee dehydrates your body. Anything with caffeine in it, any of those diet drinks and all that stuff, caffeine in it, dehydrates your body. Refined sugar dehydrates your body and depletes your body and takes away minerals and avoid, prevents all healing. Just immediately, over time, not like right away. And, and if you have a strong body, you can have some cookies and cake. I mean, it's not like you never do it. My idea is find your strength again, then indulge yourself, but just don't make it your habit of doing it all the time. So I show the people in the blood. I say, now we've just done 10 minutes of this exercise, 20 minutes. Let's go back and take another prick of blood. And they go back. And all the cells are still like they were, but the space in between, there's no garbage. What happened is the little cells that go around and clean up, they all get woken up and they start doing their job. The body is designed to heal itself. Your body, you get cut, your body heals it. You get sick, you get accident, something happens, you get exposed to heat or too much cold or something. Your body can heal itself, but you have to stop getting in the way. And you can experience this change right away tonight. 
But first, we're going to open this up for question and answers <laughs> and bring our moderator back. OK, here we are. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, uh, do we have sound? Yeah. Do we have sound? You do, at least. OK, yeah. Thank you. So it's all very simple. Easy. Well, I know that the Dutch don't like anything to be easy. I've discovered I'm that. I'm not all the Dutch. No, but I, I don't write interviewed. as fast as you do. People say, do you really believe it can be that easy? And they misinterpret what I mean by the word easy. When I say easy, I mean you can learn something in one day that would have taken me and did take me 25 years to learn. A very hard, hard practice. Very committed, hard practice. You can get in a very short time. That's what I mean by easy. Now, is skiing, how many of you ski, just so I know what country I'm in? Okay, so those of you ski. How many of you ride a bike? Okay, I got that country right, all right, so. <laughs> Riding a bike is not easy for everybody the first time. Well, in Amsterdam. <laughs> yeah, and trying to navigate is not easy. But just the act of riding a bike, for me, it was pretty easy to get on a bike. But my daughter, it took me like a lot of months to teach her to ride a bike. Some people can pick it up right away, other people can't. But until you become comfortable riding the bike, it is difficult to ride a bike. Then when you're comfortable, it's easy. Everything we learn in life has a learning curve to it. Learning curve. It's difficult, difficult. When you learn it, it gets easy. Learning a computer is easy until they change it. <laughs> then you have another learning curve and then it becomes easy. Computers make things very easy when they work. And then if they change, you have to learn again, go through the learning curve, and then it becomes easy again. So that's what I mean, it's easy. Is life easy? No. Life is stressful, difficult, shit. That's what life is. I agree with you. I, I want to ask you something. It, it was nice that you mentioned uh, Wayne Dyer. I remember him doing his uh, brisk walks around a, a small table in his hotel uh, doing his nine miles. So I committed but to that. I was wondering, yeah, I happen to know him, of course. And there's a Louise Hayes, I think is her name. Are you in good company with someone like uh, Wayne Dyer? Is that yeah, like good a, buddies. a spiritual brother? Would good we consider friends. that? Yes, but he has the same or compar comparable uh, advice to the people. Do you feel the same way? I think that anybody who's helping people, I'm, hmm. quote, a spiritual brother to. Hmm. My philosophy is actually very different from his in many ways, but I have no problem with his philosophy. I have no problem with anything anybody teaches that hmm. somebody gets benefit from. I know that there's a million different ways to climb a mountain. I know that what I'm teaching tonight, there's a million different ways I could teach it. I, I mean, had, I already know that to be I true, so a, how can there not be other ways I haven't thought of? I had a slight problem with some of the scientific sides of what you said. Well, instance, please, tell me. I have well, very little respect for science as well. I, 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 I like science, yes. but I've watched that every 10 years, science disproves itself. It does. They have a study. What doctors do, what scientists do, is prove. They're all the time proving that that study was wrong, mm -hmm. and that study's not right. What scientists told you a, year, a few years ago is salt was bad for your diet. Salt is important for everybody to have salt in their body. Ionized salt may not be that good, but sea salt and what people have been eating for a long time is salt. We've been eating it for thousands of years on this planet, and suddenly doctors come along and say, don't eat salt, it causes high blood pressure, be careful. Everybody takes salt out of their diet and gets sick. Now they tell you, most doctors will now tell you that that was a mistake, and there really is no evidence to prove that. If you have high blood pressure, maybe taking salt out will be a short-term help. What you have to do is learn to relax. There's proof showing that Chinese Qigong techniques or acupuncture can reduce blood pressure or transcendental meditation. Simple, the beginner's technique of all can call it lower blood pressure in a few, a few, few sessions. What you're going to do tonight will lower blood pressure with lots of salt in your diet. Hopefully people will okay, not science, say... Okay, science, please, give me science, okay. I, I love science. I mean, build me. computers, so let's honor mm -hmm. it too, okay. But to say that in former ages, people did not have diseases Sounds a bit wild to me, really. No, the diseases we have today, like MS, is a phenomenon of this century. Uh, cancer is a phenomenon of this cancer century. Cancer is a, a, a sickness of old age. Oh. We become okay. terribly old nowadays. Okay. All I know is I'm, I'm not a historian. Mm. 
No. I know that, that the reports show that in America, cancer has gone up from 3% of society yes. get to 30% older. of society to 50% of the society. So what does that say to me? I'm just a simple person. The amount of cancer is dramatically going up. The crisis of health care in America is out of this world. Everybody, go look at any drugstore. You go here, look at your drugstores. There's pain medications, there's digestion medications, there's diarrhea medications, there's every medication under the sun. They didn't have drugstores like that before. What they had is they had herbs until the church bear, burned. We forgive us. We forgive the church for its mistakes. I forgive everybody for their mistakes. They burned the healers. It was too much competition. 30 million healers were burned as, as what are they called? Witches, you know, ridiculous. Now in China, they're telling the Qigong healers it's against the law. I have a friend who escaped from China, who works for me, he's a Qigong master. He, I have films of his hospital where 10,000 people a day are doing energy exercises and they're all getting healed of these sicknesses. And they don't have there, by the way, as many of these kind of sicknesses that we have. That's the Chinese. And I look to India, I go to India. I can see with my own eyes what kind of sicknesses they have. But it's changing because what they're getting is Coca-Cola, they're getting all of these modern types of foods that we have, and these modern foods are making us sick. Okay. So we just disagree there. I'm just telling you where I get my information. I'm just a simple person. I look around the world and I see things. Okay, go ahead. I would like to invite the, the audience. If you want to ask a question, you can walk up to one of the microphones. If you are shy to speak English, you can do it in Dutch, and somebody will help you translate. Yes, go ahead. You told us that you make a lot of working hours every day. I make a what? A lot of you, uh, hours working, hour, working. working hours every day. Why don't you spend more time to relax every day? What do you do to relax every day? <laughs> okay, why don't I spend more hours to relax? I'm such a lazy guy. I told you I was a very lazy guy. I said when I write a book, I say a month. On that month, I'm going to write a book. When I go into writing a book, I go into an altered state of ecstasy. So what do you do for fun, John? I get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and I write a book. And I do it wonderfully. When do you do your shopping? <laughs> well, I don't really do that much shopping, by the way. I, when I was growing up as a child, I had this... You know, we're affected by our childhood a lot. My grandfather would give us his grandchildren a present. We'd all go to the, to the department store and we'd buy a whole year's of clothing in one day. We basically, they would open the store just for my family. It was on a Sunday. The stores used to be closed. And they'd come, and we'd pick whatever we wanted. He was somewhat wealthy, and that was his gift to the children. So somehow that stuck with me. I go shopping once a year, and I buy everything. And that's it. So when, that, I just answered that little joke question, when do you shop? I'm one of the most relaxed people I've ever met. I have a fun time. What I do for fun, somebody asked me today, what do you do for fun? One of the things I do for fun is I heal people. Some, of, some people love their work. And when I heal people, I just put my hands over their head. I let the energy flow. They weep, they cry, they wake, they say, my pain is gone. That's one of the most fun things I could ever imagine doing. When did you start all this? Well, the miracle healing started three years ago. What happened? Something has happened in the world. This is what I'm telling you. And I want to give you an example of this. You'll like this example. It's about algebra. We had a big... <laughs> conflict at dinner over algebra. When a child is 13 or 14 years old, a brain change takes place in their brain. Any algebra teacher will notice this. On Friday, that child cannot understand algebra. They can't be taught algebra. A younger child cannot be taught. It requires a brain function called abstract thinking. On Monday, Something has happened. The child is no different, except now that child can learn algebra. If somebody comes along and teaches them. If nobody teaches them, they will never develop that skill. Now that skill of advanced thinking, it's abstract thinking. A child around 13 and 14, the switch takes place at puberty. To develop that ability, you have to have somebody teach you algebra is one way of developing it. Another way to develop that ability is to talk and have somebody acknowledge and appreciate what you have to say and not squash you. So, See, most of us as teenagers, when we expressed ourselves, our parents always know better. And so they put us down. So one day it sort of woke up in you. I thought not just in me. In the whole world. In one day, in the whole world. It's still sleeping in some people. But for a mass of people, mostly people who watch TV, it's in the West. 
for a mass of people one day happen and suddenly the techniques that I'm going to teach you tonight, if you somebody asks me to do it, because she's not going to let me talk unless it's a question. Uh, but they, you talk so much, why don't you just teach? I do talk so much. My wife complains the same way. We could have a, I, can, I cannot put a cloth over your cage. No. Well, could you simply teach these techniques? Is it, does it take very long? Because, you know, they kick me out in uh, 20 minutes. Well, what I can't teach, I can always tell you, refer you to my book, but I'll give you a good experience of it tonight. Mm -mm. And what I noticed, I'm answering your first question, which was, what happened three years ago? Three years ago, I was doing some healing. I was doing a big healing class. I was teaching people self-healing techniques. And around that time, they had pretty good ability to do it. Then afterwards, I would do it till like 12 o'clock at night. It would end at seven. Anybody was really sick, I'd do them 10, 20 minutes each person. And was getting good results. All you can expect is people have some improvement. They feel better and they feel motivated to do the exercises to heal themselves. Well, one night, I was just so exhausted and all these people were still there. And I just, I couldn't do it. I had no energy left inside of me. So I just said, please. Now, I, I, I'm a very spiritual person, so I, I, I said, God, help me. You know, like when you, a lot of people say they don't believe in God until there's a tragedy. And then like start asking, okay, if there's a God, help me. Okay, so at that point, I'm, oh, please, I cannot do this. Would you do this? Please do this. And this force just came down through my hands. And the next, I think, eight people all had miracle healings. These are people at MS, people had bones that weren't healing, people had sicknesses. Uh, one lady, you know, hadn't felt her leg in years, lived in a wheelchair. She started feeling tingling down her leg. Six months later, she wrote me a letter saying she just went dancing with her husband. She just so transformed. But anyway, that night I knew something was up, something happened. So then I started doing it more, and I started even simplifying my technique. And really, the technique I'm going to teach you is, first I help you, you feel this healing energy. You first have to be able to feel the healing energy. And remember, I started introducing this idea by saying, see, I don't want it to sound too esoteric, because some people are all like, I mean, one interviewer came to me today asking me, she said, she read the book, she said she did. She said, I look at some of those techniques, it's ridiculous. I could never do that. I said, which one? But she said, some of them are good, some are good. And I said, so you're talking about the technique called decharging. She goes, yeah, I could never do that. I said, you because- You don't know about decharging, yes. I'm making the point. So it's because so. she didn't think she could do it. What you do in decharging is the same thing when you smell a rose. When you smell a rose, these don't have much smell, but they're still nice. <laughs> these don't smell, do they? No, they don't. But they look very pretty. Why is it you give roses to sick people? It literally makes them healthier. Why is it that you give roses to a girlfriend? It literally puts her in a more romantic mood. Why is it that if she's mad at you, you give her roses? It will literally help her to forgive you sooner. Why is it when you're an entertainer and you've just entertained the whole audience, they throw roses at you because you're completely exhausted? And somehow people knew that roses have healing power. Not just roses, but the lake, the canals, the fresh air, the sunshine, the ocean, all these things have healing power. John Gray, you're driving me crazy. I know. Teach us the technique. You've got to learn to relax. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I told you, it's like smelling a rose. That's the technique. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. No like the man who asked the question, when do you, you write all this time, when do you relax? You know, like something's wrong with me because I work hard. I enjoy my work one and I relax. For example, flying in a plane here, I was at nine hours. Most people go, oh, you must be tired after a plane ride. Are you kidding? Nine hours with nobody asking me for anything. I get to totally relax. Do I listen to music? No. I just have my roses in front of me. I can be totally happy just smelling a rose. It's just like going on the beach, it's connecting with nature. There's a natural frequency in nature that if you connect with it, it heals you, it makes you happy, it makes you peaceful as you learn to do it. And we just don't know how to do it. We're moving too fast to do it. So judging me for working so hard, yeah, if I'm stressed, but if I'm relaxed, that's what life's about, is enjoying your life. Even when, now is my life easy all the time? No, so, shit happens all around me. Is this, is then I just take a rose and smell it. Or I drink a glass of water. Let's yeah, drink here's, together. Here's Let's a, drink together. <laughs> Mr. Gray. I know, you want a real drink, but we're gonna Can have water. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Not yet, all right, another really question. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, I am happy to take it. Well, 
I, I really like, I would really like before I go out the door to experience something. You do something so we, so we can do it with you. And that would be really you, nice. How you, much time do I have? You know, we can't share all the roses in the vase, so we would like to do, do it. And you, you already gave us some ideas and hints okay. and the stories about that. Yeah, and maybe so it's a technique to sort of make, you want make us feast and wild That's right. to get That's it technique. ready. But it doesn't work unless you no, want it. No, I would like really to you experience it. You have to really it. want it. Remember I told you when it started happening? I said, please, God, I really need your help. You have to really want it. If you want it, it comes. If you don't have strong desire, nothing happens. So I got to like build up your desire a little bit. I mean, she's, she's just jumping the gun, you know? I mean, she's got to like learn a little control here. But you're delightful. You're absolutely delightful. Okay, another question? How, how much time do we have, by the way? Yep. I think they kick us out of the building at around 10, before 10. An hour? Quarter of an, quarter of an hour, 15 minutes? Yeah. Well, I can see why you're so worried. That. Uh, okay. Would you re stand at the microphone All otherwise? Right. Did you have any results with your healing program with AIDS pa patients? I have never worked with AIDS patients. I've worked with one who said he had dramatic improvement and they're getting together. They've now, because of the improvement he had, where PBS, uh, which is the public, National Public Broadcasting Company of America, they're now doing a documentary on my work. We've just opened a cancer clinic, cancer recovery clinic of 20 people who are terminally ill and they are filming and interviewing all these people before we begin the program. Because I have a list of people and also my friend from China has a list of people, of people who have healed themselves. We don't heal them. Very important. We help them heal themselves. So do Otherwise, I, I get sued <laughs> or I get put I in jail or something. Do I understand correctly? You don't eat sugar, you drink a lot of water, you go, uh, you, you surround yourself with nature. I'm yeah. So and what else? Okay, then that's just the real big technique. We're going to do it now, okay? <laughs> John Gray, let's have it. So you asked me, you asked if people with AIDS been healed. Uh, what this, I can only share, I only try to share my own experience. I have a friend who says he's healed many people of AIDS. I've never seen it. And I've seen people who have various kinds of cancer be healed completely. Uh, they have no symptoms. The doctors say it's not in you at all. I have x-rays to prove it, show the tumors shrinking. I did one demonstration, shrank a tumor 50% in 15 minutes in front of people. It just started shrinking, people saw it. It doesn't always happen that way. But I see these things, I believe in miracles now, and that's what I'm telling you. So having spoken this long, hopefully you're a little more open-minded to the idea that things are happening now that, never, that didn't happen for everybody. I think most people believe that miracles have happened, but maybe for some people, but not for me. Miracles can happen for everybody, and we don't have to wait till we're terminally ill to have a miracle. The miracle can be the jet lag didn't wear me out. The miracle could be that I'm able to forgive my wife when I'm mad at her. The miracle can be that I didn't catch cold or flu when everybody else did. The miracle can be that the desserts are being served, and I go, you know, I'd rather maintain my health right now. I don't need to eat that, and I don't feel any discomfort from not eating it. You can choose what you eat without without emotionally eating to make you happy, you eat what's good for you. And your body tells you what's good for you. And you don't have to eat a perfect diet. Given all that, now we'll do the exercise. Okay. Thanks. I hope, I've never done this in, in uh, Holland, so I hope it works here. Well, we're below sea level, so you'll like it. Oh, this technique doesn't work below sea level. Hey. Uh, actually, it does. Can I? Thank you. Keep the cookie. All right. Now, please understand me correctly. I'm not saying for this to work, you have to give up alcohol, that you have to give up coffee. I am saying that if you want more results, don't eat refined sugar or eat very moderate amounts of refined sugar. If you drink coffee and alcohol, then drink more water. If you start this program and you do this regularly, like 20, 40 minutes a day, you can do it in the shower in the morning, you do it while you're driving the car, listening to music, you do it when you're walking, you can even do it when you're riding your bike, except in this traffic, that's a little too much stress. But it's something you can do at any time. But to actually develop and learn the technique, it's good to be in a nice quiet room. And it's good to have some roses around. We have this beautiful flower arrangement here. They just help, and I'll explain why. See, there's a way you have to understand. You could do the same thing we're going to do with these roses. You can do with water. So you can do it in the shower. You can do sitting by the fire. You sit by the fire. You do the same thing. Nature helps put us in the frequency. 
If I was to sing a song, and let's say you couldn't sing, but I can sing, and I'm really a good singer, you could follow along with me, right? Most people can't. I'm not a good singer, but my daughter is. When she sings a song, I sing with her. It's funny, even when she sings a song, I start remembering some of the words. I can't do it on my own, but when she does it, because she's gifted at it, I go along. How many people can relate to that? That's called resonance. The flowers are resonating, healing, emotional. The frequency of the flowers, particularly roses, tends to soothe our emotional body, the emotional part of us. This frequency, if you can connect with it and you can feel it, resonate with it, just like it's singing its song, it's singing its song. Be happy, love, everything's okay. You're beautiful and so is the world, even though there's shit everywhere. Okay, okay. <laughs> this frequency helps you connect with that which is good. If you can connect with this frequency, so I'm going to teach you how to do that. You can connect with any frequency this way. It's learning to resonate better with what you're in front of. See, anybody smells a rose. That's why they say stop and smell the roses, smell the flowers, smell the tulips, whatever. Oh, tulips, they don't smell, do they? They do? Okay, you're the experts. All right. Smell of so, And If we can stop and relax in nature, that's what heals us, is learning to relax. So this is an exercise of relaxation, uses the breath, uses the mind and always uses something in nature. Those three things together, the mind, the breath, and nature. So here we have roses. Remember when I said desire creates energy? We already, because we all have so many desires that aren't fulfilled, we have lots of energy. The problem is too much energy. To solve the problem, what we want to do is take away out of our bodies all energy that we don't need. Just take it away. Think about a neurosis, like anger or jealousy. Jealousy is a good one. It's like a little X. Everybody has a little jealous in them, just a little. But if you have blocked energy, it's like blowing up a balloon. The X gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like when you're stressed, your problems get bigger and bigger and bigger. When you're relaxed, what happens? They shrink down. When you relax, you're letting go of all that blocked energy. So what we're going to do is send the extra energy out of us into these roses. Roses, particularly cut roses, like it, or any cut fl flower, because they're disconnected from the earth and they like more energy. They're pulling it. They help you because they pull the energy out of you, as well as give you something to resonate with. So you learn to let the energy pour right out of you into these roses. At a certain point, you'll be sitting in your chair and you just aim your hands like this and you'll start to feel <laughs> energy. It's like ray guns coming right out of you. I mean, it sounds so ridiculous. It's so bizarre until you feel it. Okay, so you have energy coming out of you. So you send the energy out into the roses. And then after you send it out for a little while, then you ask for it to come back. You say, okay, now come on back. And this time your intention is you just have the energy come in, but this time it's not blocked and it fills you up. Like if you want to be happy and feel more comfortable, give me more energy to, feel, to blow up the happy, the happy balloon. <laughs> give me energy to give this talk. Give me energy to feel more forgiving. You just think, what do I want more energy for? And you pull that energy and it goes that direction instead of putting all your energy on the frustration or the upset or the tension that you have in your life. So first thing is to be able to feel the energy. Now I'm going to do it so you can watch me do it and I'll tell you what I'm doing. Healing energy. Now what is healing energy? It's what's in the roses. It's what moves in your body when you're sick. It's what's missing when you're not sick. So we're talking to it. Now you think, why is he talking to healing energy? Does it speak English? Does it speak your language? Does it, it doesn't speak any language. But it responds to me when I call it. Just like my arm responds to me when I say move up. Healing energy will respond. But how do we connect as human beings? How are we most used to connecting? With language. So if we use language, we can connect with the, the energy very quickly. Now you put your hands up in the air to start with. Why? That's another trick. When the blood flows down, your body thinks you're losing blood and there's an emergency. So energy, healing energy, flows to the top of the fingertips. So when you put your hands up, you'll feel tingling, which is a tingling response. Whenever blood leaves the extremities, it starts to tingle. Like if you hold your legs crossed, they, start, they go to sleep and then they tingle a whole lot. That's because all this energy comes in and says, hey, you've cut off the blood supply, we've got a, a problem here. That's why when bloodletting did work a long time ago, it's like if you have a problem over here, all this blocked energy is here, they bleed over here, the energy would leave there and come over here. It's like if you've got a problem over here and you get a bigger problem, what happens? 
you forget this problem. Suddenly you forgive your wife. Now you're just trying to make the money to live. You know, everything's fine when you got a bigger problem. So what we're doing here, we raise our hands and blood starts to come down. So the body says alert, alert, and energy goes to the fingertips a lot. By doing that, you focus your attention. This is a meditation on your fingertips. So let's all do it right now. I want you to blood just start coming down. Now, if you're really sick and you can't hold them up for long, that's okay. Now, even if it's silly, don't worry. I know a few of you are going, what is this? Come on, just try it. You know, so you at least know what we're all experiencing or not experiencing. You'll keep your hands up. I'm just letting the blood run down. Okay, now you don't have to do anything except just listen to me as you're doing it and think some of the thoughts I'm having. So as I feel this tingling energy, I now give it a name, healing energy. Got to call it something. We call it bozo, anything, but you got to talk to it. So healing energy, I really need your help. Please come. Now I add breath to it. Healing energy. I really need your help. Please come. Healing energy. I really need your help. Please come. Please come to my fingertips is what I mean by that. And you can speak that in your own language. It doesn't have to be English, but silently in your mind. Healing energy. I really need your help. Please come. Now you silently do that without my saying it. Just being aware of your fingertips. Now when I went to master healers, when they had an effect on my eyes, what I would feel is the same thing many of you are feeling in your fingertips. Just a little tingling. That's what healing energy feels like. Now we do something that the Chinese add to this technique, which is slow movement, because we're used to moving so quickly. Bring your hands down, like this, and we're going to go slowly up, we'll go healing energy. Breathe in, breathe out. I really need your help, breathe in. Breathe out. Please come to my fingertips. Hands up. Healing energy. I really need your help. Please come. Now this time when you say, I really need your help, think about a place in your life where you need help, where you're hurting. Healing energy. I really need your help. Feel the energy coming through your fingertips, responding to your request, to your intention. Please come. Now we do another move. Hands slowly come together. You can watch me do this. Slowly come like this. And then pull away ever so slightly. And then go closer. And you'll feel a magnetic field. You're just becoming aware of your own body's magnetic field. Activate is the request. Just activate. Activate your healing power. Now you silently say that with you taking a deep breath. Activate your healing power.
Breathe in, breathe out. Activate your healing power. So you're feeling this tingling energy, you're feeling a magnetic field. If you're not feeling it, then you have to move your hands just slowly in and out, moving it closer, pulling it out. And then you pause to see if you can feel it without moving. Feel tingling in your fingertips. All has to be your fingertips. Some of you will feel it all the way in your hands. It'll go all the way to your elbows. Some of you feel all the way to your feet. But a really great beginning is just in your fingertips. That's all that's really necessary. Activate healing energy right now. Activate your healing power in each person in this room. Now what you do is you put your hands out, just aiming them at these flowers. I'm aiming down, but it's the same thing. You're aiming at them, but I'm aiming down. And we're talking to healing energy, that little buzzing in your fingertips, and you're just saying to it, you silently say it, and it's your meditation, one simple phrase, healing energy. Use these flowers to take away my excess energy. <coughs> healing energy. Use your roses, or these roses, to take away my excess energy. You don't have to do anything, you just ask. And the energy starts moving towards your fingertips, coming out of your body, through your fingertips, to the roses. Healing energy. Right now, take away the excess energy in our bodies. Use your roses to take away the excess energy in my body. And in each person here tonight, take away the excess energy. Open the channels so they can feel this energy flowing through their fingertips right now. Here it comes, big wave of energy now coming through. Take away my excess energy. That's what you're thinking. Use these flowers to take away my excess energy. Now that's letting energy go out. Now we're gonna let energy come back. The phrase here is use these flowers to fill me with your energy. Use these roses to send me your energy. Use these roses to send me energy. I'm just letting the energy come to you now. You just change the direction, that's all. Use your roses, healing energy. Use these roses to send me healing energy. Healing energy, please, right now, through these roses, come to each person in this room, fill them with peace. Fill them with peace in their lives. Heal their bodies. Give them strength. Heal their hurt. Feel the hurt from long ago. Fill them with your love, with the love energy. Feel them now. It's all, all you have to say is just healing energy. Use your roses to send me healing energy. And feel the truth in your heart of how you want to feel. I want to feel more loving, happier, more fulfilled, more peaceful, healthy. Feel what you want right now. 
Desire helps pull the energy in right now. Here comes a wave. Thank you so much, healing energy. And, uh, you know, let's see how many people when your hands were up felt some tingling in your fingertips. Let me see. Raise your hands high. Okay. Why don't you look around. Those who didn't feel it, it doesn't mean you can't feel it. It just means that you didn't feel it right away. It's like learning to ride a bike. Some people get on it right away. Now, those people who put your hands like this, do you felt the electric